Welcome to Stan the Energy Man. Stan Osterman here, as usual, coming to you from the great state of Hawaii, the beautiful community of Kailua, on the windward side of Oahu, our main island. And we're going to talk about sustainability. You know, sustainability is a kind of a an interesting topic. Um, when you tie it to things like agriculture and renewable energy, it really gets people excited in Hawaii because a long time ago in Hawaii, these islands were totally sustainable. They had a population similar to what we have in Hawaii right now, and they didn't import anything. And today we import not over 90% of our food and, and everything else coming in on big container ships that put a lot of carbon in the atmosphere. We don't like that. But sustainability is something we're trying to get back to in Hawaii. So on today's show, we've got a couple of guests um, associated with Sustainable Energy Hawaii. And um, Richard Ha is going to be joining us a little bit later, but for, for now, we have um, a new guest, at least for my show, Nicole uh, Lautzi, Lautzi um, who works at the University of Hawaii. So, Nicole, welcome to the show. And um, I, I hear you're a whiz on sustainability, and you can probably give a, a better definition than me. But um, in terms of getting Hawaii where it needs to be um, economically, which is being sustainable for me has a huge economic impact. Here in Hawaii, we could, if we could reduce our dependence on imported oil and replace that with clean energy, and if we didn't have to bring in so many things on ships and airplanes, we could probably improve our economy dramatically here in Hawaii, especially with times like now during COVID, when so many small businesses are shut down and, and like, um, our tax revenues are down, our economy's really hurting, um, sustainability could make a huge difference. So welcome to the show. And could you start off by just introducing yourself and telling us a little bit about what you do at the University of Hawaii and some of your background? Yeah, sure. Um, nice to be here. Thanks for the introduction. Yeah, my name is Nicole Lautzi. I am an associate tenured faculty at the University of Hawaii. Um, my position is within the Hawaii Institute of Geophysics and Planetology. Um, it's HIGP there, uh, which is within the School of Ocean Earth Science and Technology at the University and um, in my position, I founded what we named the Hawaii Groundwater and Geothermal Resources um, Research Center, so HGGRC. And uh, my background, I'm from Bay Area, California. I did my undergraduate degree in geology with a specialization in chemistry at UCLA. I came to Hawaii to pursue my PhD graduate school here. Um, I left for about four years and then came back uh, as a postdoctoral researcher uh, and started then from, from then my faculty position uh, where I started focusing on geothermal energy. Great. So as a kid growing up in the Bay Area, did earthquakes drive some of your interest in geology? <laughs> you would think. Uh, I, I did experience, I was in seventh or eighth grade when the uh, what was it, the 1980s 7.0, 6.9 hit the Bay Area. I was a big San Francisco Giants fan, and they were about to play the A's in the World Series, the Bay Bridge World Series. Anyway, so I remember that vividly. But but no, actually, I, through high school, I was just interested in in the pure sciences. I loved chemistry, I loved physics, and I loved the planet. And um, and so I started out as a biochem major at UCLA, and I happened to have a few classes in the Earth Sciences department. And biomed, I was kind of in a competitive environment with pre med majors. Um, there's there is no pre-med major, so they were majoring in biochemistry. And uh, in the earth science building, there were all these beautiful pictures of the outdoors and rocks. And, and so I looked into what that degree meant. And, I, and the advanced level classes sounded really exciting to me. So I switched to my degree. Great. Kind of a fun so, story. <laughs> so when it comes to geothermal, you know, that's mm -hmm. a really, I for me personally, a really big topic because I consider for a lot of reasons, and I, it'll take me a whole hour to tell you why. I consider hydrogen and geothermal as like the perfect matchup to make Hawaii sustainable. With geothermal being providing electricity to um, to create electrolysis to make really pure green hydrogen, and then using the green hydrogen for not only transportation but also for the grid uh, here on Oahu, where you know, when it comes to transporting energy, um, you can transport it in oil, of course, but if you transported liquid hydrogen, you'd be clean and carbon free all the way through. So for me, 
geothermal plays a huge role maybe 15, 20 years from now in the future <clears throat> to really make Hawaii an energy independent state, uh, maybe even an energy exporter. So with your experience in geothermal, could you tell us about some of the advancements? I, by the way, I've been to Iceland at least four or five times. Mm -hmm. So I get what geothermal can do for an island community. Could you kind of give us a, a picture of what your view of geothermal doing for Hawaii, uh, how it could be done cleanly, safely, and effectively here? And, and give us some positive uh, notes on geothermal. I, I agree when I started geothermal research about 2011 or 12 what really impressed me two things really impressed me one i was fairly unfamiliar with what ge a geothermal resource meant and uh i mean it's an amazing resource if, if it's available to a given location in terms of its baseload power the amount of energy output for square footage of land needed to produce the energy and then yeah generally because it's 24 7 you know always on the department of energy says you need to throttle back when the consumers don't want to consume a lot of energy and so it can be used like things for hydrogen product production um that and the second thing that really impressed me with specifically to hawaii is how little hawaii the state knows about the extent of its geothermal resource so most people think of puna being the only place where geothermal can be produced and in fact, I'm about to conclude a five year long Department of Energy funded statewide resource assessment. And this is the first resource assessment since 1985. So 30 year hiatus or 35 now, um, as we start to produce our results, which indicates there's a, a probability, we don't know the answer to this for sure, of there being a geothermal resource on all islands in the state. So including Oahu and Kauai. Um, so we can't even really start to talk about what the development would look like. Do we need to develop just on Big Island and then have an underwater cable to export to the other islands? Or does each island in fact have its unique geothermal resource that can be developed to assist with the renewable energy portfolio of that state? Um, and to me, this should be almost the main driver of the discussion of renewables in the state of Hawaii. I agree with you completely. I'm, I'm familiar with the study was, that was done, I believe in 1974 by the University of Hawaii that showed that there were at least three Oahu possibilities for geothermal, one at Bellows Air Force Station on the windward side, one in West Oahu in Waianae in that area. And I believe it also included somewhere in Pearl City and then Diamond Head Crater, three or four locations that had potential for geothermal. And it, it didn't go in, and at that time, this is 74, so that's what, 50 years ago. Um, the technology, geothermal technology, wasn't that well developed. So in today's world, you know, and, and I go back to Iceland, you know, geothermal energy is pretty mature. And I'm not sure compared to Iceland what Pune Geothermal is technology development wise, but in today's state of the art cutting edge geothermal technology, what are the safety uh, safety relative factors and things like that in terms of you know one of the problems we have in hawaii is we introduce these really great ideas we always worry about second third order effects and and most of the time we don't don't get them until after we've spent millions or billions of dollars you know putting it in the ground and then then all of a sudden we realize it wasn't such a great idea so what does geothermal really look like from a practical standpoint for the state of Hawaii in the next 20 years? Well, I, I, I guess, so my expertise is in exploring for geothermal with my geologic background. Um, so trying to characterize the subsurface and there's utility in doing that for many reasons, geothermal being one of them. Um, so that's really my niche. Um, but I can say, and, and I'm not entirely familiar with you know, the regulations, but, but the regulatory process for geothermal in Hawaii is very conservative, meaning very strict. And, um, you know, for sulfur, sulfur dioxide output, the Department of Health, Hawaii Department of Health regulations restrict what is permissible for Pune Geothermal Venture to admit to be, I believe it's three orders of magnitude lower. So, PGV will get fined if their emissions are of sulfur dioxide are three orders of magnitude lower than OSHA, which is a scientific standard. Um, so for geothermal under the current regulatory process, 
in Hawaii for geothermal, a, a new development to get permitted and approved, that plant will need to be very extremely safe, okay. is, is, is basically how I put it. So compared to what Madame Pelly does at Volcano National Park in terms of sulfur dioxide, can you kind of compare that to like what we're allowing? <laughs> Yeah, no, I exactly. That's it. so. I, what Pele emits is orders of magnitude higher, just a, a, in terms of sulfur dioxide during the 2018 East Rift Zone eruption of Kilauea. Um, those levels of carbon dioxide, or sul sorry, sulfur dioxide, were extremely higher than what what PGV has emitted, even in okay. in terms of times of blowout, um, where where the facility has been fined. Well, I've also, at least I've been told, and this may be outside your area of expertise, that we don't have to use as hot of um, a source of geothermal energy to produce energy now as we did 20, 30 years ago when they were really just kind of getting into geothermal. Um, do we really have to go deep enough where we, we end up getting sulfur and sulfur dioxide emissions to still produce a reasonable amount of geothermal energy? Not necessarily. I don't think we have a comprehensive enough data set to be able to understand that question. But certainly, I mean, at, we, as a geologist, volcanologist, we anticipate that the hottest resource in the state, which is favorable for electricity production, um, would be where there was the most recent volcanic activity. And so certainly then it's kind of a no-brainer to go to the most active, volcanically active location in the state, which is Kilauea's East Rift Zone. And so that's where most of the exploration for geothermal in the state of Hawaii has been focused. And really where we have only until very recently deep wells that can assess what the temperature at depth is, which is what we need to know. We need more of those deep wells outside of Kilauea's East Rift Zone to know what the temperature gradient to depth is and know what, what type of development facility, whether it's a steam plant, a binary plant, and as you said, the technology keeps on getting more and more progressive towards, you know, developing lower temperature resources. So, so what is feasible? We need to know what kind of temperatures we have at what depths, and then what the permeability of the rock is to enable fluid flow to extract the heat um, in traditional geothermal. I tell you what, we're going to take a quick break here, and uh, maybe we can pull Richard into the discussion if he's uh, on the Zoom meter here. Uh, back in the studio so we'll turn it back over to eric to to do some commercials and we'll try and get um richard on on the line as well Welcome back to Stan Energy Man. Stan Osterman here with Nicole Lautzi and joining us is Mr. Richard Hoffer in the Big Island with a beautiful picture of uh, Hilo Bay and the beautiful mountains behind him with the snow on top and everything. Um, I know that's not a live picture because it's too pretty, but Richard looks pretty, so who cares? Anyway, welcome to the show, Richard. And Richard is um, part of a group on the Big Island um, called Sustainable Energy Hawaii. And um, Richard, we've already talked to Nicole for a little bit about geothermal uh, energy and different sources on the different islands. Um, could you give us some some words about uh, Sustainable Energy Hawaii as a as an organization and what you're looking at doing there on the Big Island and for the state? Yeah, sure. Um, Sustainable Energy Hawaii. We formed it in January this this year, and it was at the same time we entered the. Uh, uh, 
power purchase agreement between Helco and PGV as a uh, participant. In other words, we are a, a supporter. And uh, 10 years prior to that, you know, we were pretty much uh, aware of what was taking place with energy and specifically um, shale oil. You know, the, come about 2009 or so, we, we started to get indications that it wasn't going to last. You know, it was, it was new then, but because it depleted so quickly, 90% of what was going to come out comes out in the first uh, uh, four years then. And then as technology uh, increased by, you know, several years ago, it was down to three years, 90% in three years. Now, clearly that's not sustainable. So what they were doing was making sure that as wells started to decline, they would start to uh, drill more. So they were up to, I think, maybe about 700 um, uh, different uh, drilling drilling um, uh, pads, yeah? So, so now it's down to below 200 or so. So, so now it, it, it's pretty clear that by next year, we'll see another drop in, in oil, oil supplies. And, and what, what is the main thing is, is that uh, it takes, the, the whole economy is made up of oil. You know, the, and the reason for it, there's a difference between a gallon of diesel and a gallon of orange juice. Yeah, so that's, that's the difference. And you gotta kind of be really aware that, that this is what runs the economy. And yeah, I, don't think, I don't think most people are aware of how energy dense the fuels are that we use today and how much energy is stored up in those fuels. We take it for granted in the fact that we really don't make oil, we just harvest it. We harvest it from the ground and we pull it out of the ground and it's subsidized. And I mean, if you buy gasoline or diesel in Europe or Australia or wherever, any two dollars a gallon it's it's expensive and that's because it's not subsidized so if we had to pay the real price of those fuels for that really efficient stored fossil fuel energy um we'd be paying a lot more and there's cleaner ways to do it and here in hawaii and that's why we talk about sustainability in hawaii we have the resources to make our own energy including to make our own electricity for a future that from my perspective, is going to include mostly electric vehicles, whether they're plug-in electric or hydrogen fuel cell, and the grid, which is going to be looking at more renewable energy sources. And like Nicole mentioned right off the bat, um, baseload power. I mean, geothermal represents a, a absolutely unbeatable um, baseload power source, not only for the Big Island, but for Maui, Oahu, and possibly even Kauai. So we, we learned a lot from her in the first 15 minutes. So um, I know you two folks talk a little bit more. What are, you know, when, I, I think when Nicole's um, paper comes out and gets published, it's gonna be an eye opener for all of our legislature and all of our county councils in terms of the availability of renewable energy in the form of geothermal for all the islands. And quite frankly, if we don't have to transport it I mean, although I'd love to see liquid hydrogen on the Big Island being sent all over the world, um, but if we could make it on Maui and, and Oahu, holy mackerel, that's a game changer for the state that, that would be hard to beat. So um, for the Big Island, right now it shows the most potential because you've actually got PGV going. Um, so it'll probably start on the Big Island, but what's your plan, at least for the Big Island, Richard, on making sure that everybody understands the impact of geothermal in a safe, clean environment on the Big Island to make it part of our clean energy resources. Yeah, you, you know, um, compared to the rest of the world, we are incredibly lucky. You know, I, I read somewhere that only about 1% of the world has has this resource available to them. And we're, we're one of them. Yeah. I mean, it's just incredible. But, but at the same time, you know, when, when oil starts to decline, and this is what really scares me. I, I've been doing this for 10 years, you know, and, and watching it uh, move. And then the uh, uh, pandemic sits right on top of it. When, as soon as we get out of it, we, we're going to be facing a real serious situation. So, so we don't have time. And we, we really need to get, get going. And, and, you know, and, and I'm sure Nicole talked about um, all the different uh, 
possibilities we have of uh, analyzing you using the, the water wells and using uh, the, the different uh, places that they've, they've uh, 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 surveyed and stuff like that. And yet there, there can be a lot more to be done because you know, when you compare this us against like say New Zealand, for example, I, I was down there at PGV with uh, Ikaiko Marzo and, and a friend of his from New Zealand and the New Zealand guy, you know, I asked him, gee, how, how's you guys resource down there? And he basically said that we've done a lot of testing and stuff. So there's a bunch of places that are sitting wait, waiting to be used. And we're not like that, yeah? We're, we're not at that point. And of course their resource is shallower, but, but nevertheless, yeah. they're ready to go, yeah? So, you know, what's really interesting, you mentioned that we're really fortunate to have the resources, but it's even bigger than that because we're part of the ring of fire, although we're smack in the middle of it around the whole Pacific, but we don't have the kind of volcanoes that could be super dangerous like many of the other nations that have the geothermal resources available, including the continental U.S. I think they're like some of what is it um the big uh, national parks and where you got uh, the old faithful geyser and stuff they're sitting on top of the northwest of a huge geothermal uh supply but it's also really dangerous you've had mount st helens you've got other you know things in, in alaska you got great geothermal but those volcanoes aren't really friendly we've got friendly volcanoes you know <laughs> we've got the kind of volcanoes you want to have in in a geothermal world to make geothermal energy so Melissa, what, what do you think about that? You're the you're the geology expert. How's ge how's Hawaii's resources? That's a, I mean it's a, it's an interesting point you make. And actually, so the Pacific Northwest has hydropower, so it's also a, a portfolio that needs to be considered, right? And I think Washington, they the Pacific Northwest is looking at assessing their geothermal resource for for further energy production, but they also have a lot larger percentage of renewable from hydropower. Um, California actually is one of the largest geothermal producers from what I know, and they have something like over 2000 megawatts, or that's in their, their plan um, in this century. 2000 megawatts, Hawaii has 38 megawatts, although studies have suggested that we also have over 2000 megawatts, which could almost meet the entire state electricity demand, if we could just come to terms with exploring and, and developing it, right? Um, in terms of our, our volcanoes being safe, I maybe know a little bit too much as a volcanologist <laughs> PhD here because there is evidence that Kilauea had explosive eruptions in its past. So we might be a little bit misled that our, we have passive volcanoes here. They have a possibility to erupt explosively as well. Um, but at least for, I mean, future century project projections from what we know, especially in the older volcanoes, that the hazard of a volcanic eruption hurting a geothermal production facility is really low relative to most of the rest of the world um, where there's magmatic geothermal production. Um, so well, there's I bought, also- I bought some property in North Kona thinking it'd be really safe because we're, we're not in the path of lava from Mauna Loa or Mauna Kea if it happens to go up. And then I read that Huala Lai is actually one of the more dangerous <laughs> cinder cones in the whole state. And I'm only 20 miles from getting bombarded by an explosive eruption in Huala Lai. So yeah, I, I hear you. But for generally speaking, we're we do have the nicer volcanoes on the planet. Yeah, our our shield shield building volcanoes are sh yeah. are yeah. And they create some great water too. In fact, I think the Big Island has has we, Richard and I have talked about this because he has uh, hydroelectric on one of his farms. He's had it for probably ten years now, five or ten years at least. And you know we don't exploit that power source as much as I think we should with all the ag we used to have on sugar and pineapple we have all the flumes and all of the the plumbing in to do in-stream hydroelectric and I don't see where we're not doing more of that it wouldn't be on the multi-megawatt scale as you talked about but um, that's one resource that I also push besides um, geothermal but I tell you what Richard why don't we give you the last word we're going to wrap up here and and wrap up the show um, we're going to have Melissa, I mean, Nicole back on a, a later show. And, um, but why don't you close us out with, um, with uh, geothermal for the Big Island? Yeah, so, so what, you know, we know that uh, everybody's getting excited about hydrogen. I mean, all over, everybody's talking about it and it's getting, you know, and it's a big deal. 
Um, so we really need to get all of our people together and, and start to discuss this up front so we know what our alternatives are and from a scientific point of view, what are the con consequences and stuff like this and not be left behind. So that's what Sustainable Energy Hawaii is looking to do. And I, I'm so happy that you had Nicole on and I've talked to her, you know, and, and I, I'm really impressed with what, what uh, she wants to do and, you know, what we can do. Yeah, so Great. thanks for the opportunity. Okay, Nicole, do you have any closing words as, a, as our geology expert here on uh, how you see Hawaii exploiting geothermal in the future to help with our energy? I, I guess in general, and, I, and as Richard and I have talked about, I mean, it's the existential crisis or threat of like climate change that concerns me every day. I have little kids and, you know, is this planet going to survive? And so I feel like the work that I do is trying to understand what's happening in the subsurface. And that's related to understanding our fresh groundwater supply and the impacts of climate change on that. I've recently gotten interested in carbon storage potential in rock in the subsurface. And, and then geothermal has been kind of my niche for the past five plus years. And I just think, you know, we need to have more dialogue about it, but realizing what a good energy resource it is. And then, I mean, Richard introduced me to the implications for hydrogen production and stuff. It's really a no brainer. And we really need to better understand what's going on in our subsurface if we're going to make it through this existential crisis. Um, and whether or not fossil fuels are there or not, we need to stop bringing them to the surface and <laughs> using them to combust right. them. I mean, we just have to, we just have to stop or our race or our species is not going to survive. And, and I, I worry about this constantly. Um, so I feel really good about the work that I do, uh, despite the challenges it has, and, and we need more funding. And I think for, for more people in the state to take it seriously, to get to the bottom of this together. Well, I agree that um, we need to be looking for a carbon-free future. Um, whether or not you're a climate change uh, you know, advocate or not, I just don't think that it, it's right that we take things and throw them into our atmosphere that shouldn't be there. I mean, I, I get, I get poked a lot because one of my things that I used to say on my show was you wouldn't wrap your lips around your exhaust pipe and breathe. So why the heck are we still driving cars that commit those kind of uh, pollution, you know, emissions? It, it's just ridiculous. You just shouldn't be doing it. It just doesn't pass the smell test from the beginning. And when we can use hydroelectric or we can use geothermal or we can use ocean thermal, like Dr. Kroc, um, you know, is trying to get down at NOHA we should be doing it. So I appreciate both of you being on. Um, Richard's been on a couple of times, but I tell you what, Nicole, we're going to have you come back and, and uh, talk about your paper specifically and, and share some more ideas and maybe have some graphics on where we could use geothermal on all the islands here in the state of Hawaii um, to help us uh, clean up our environment and get cleaner, uh, better energy uh, the smart way. So for everyone, thanks for uh, being here, Richard. Thanks, Nicole. And Thanks for watching us out there in, in Think Tech land and Stan the Energy Man is signing off until next Tuesday. Aloha. Okay. Yeah.